Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to Rethink Culture, the podcast that shines a spotlight on business leaders who are creating intentional cultures. My name is Andreas Constantino, and I'm your host. I'm the founder of Rethink Culture, a company that aims to help create one million healthier, more fulfilling work cultures. Today, I have the pleasure of welcoming Sandy Hall. She's the owner of Recognition, a leadership development consultancy and a resilience specialist. She ran the best workplace program at IBM for New Zealand for a few years. She also has a passion for neuroscience and how it intersects with leadership. She's going to tell us more about it. And as she tells me, she's excited as she's about to go for a three day backcountry walk in the rainforest of the South Deep of New Zealand and swim with Hector dolphins. So that is an amazing intro. <laughs> Very welcome to the Rethink Culture podcast, Sandy. Thank you so much. I'm really honored and humbled to be here today, Andreas, and I'm um, excited to talk to you. You're so easy to talk to about these things because we have mutual passions. Indeed. And uh, these are culture and neuroscience, among other things. And I also love walking. Yeah, I too. Uh, and hiking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so starting, starting with, uh, where should we start? Starting with... Um, Culture, when did that become important to you? I think I've been observing people, leaders, culture all my life, if I'm really honest with you. I remember as a small child, my parents were very religious and I grew up in the church and I used to watch these preachers and watch them preach from the pulpit on a Sunday and be really fascinated by the cultures that they were forming in the churches that they were building. Mm. And um, my father and I would, at the end of um, our lunch, which we always had together on a Sunday, my brothers would be bored by this. My mum would have drifted away from the table. We would be dissecting everything the pastor had said and everything that was going on in that church culture. And I think that sparked my interest in um, leadership development and culture and accountability and ownership. Um, right back from a very early age. That's that's so interesting. How were these cultures different to the cultures you work with today, the, well, the church cultures? Quite different, I have to say. And, you know, the church turned out to be a little bit disappointing in my experience. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a Pentecostal movement that I was brought up in, and my parents didn't stay in that movement over time because what happened is due to lack of accountability, um, those leaders who became worshipped by their congregations, the good ones that were good at being impressive and um, engaging people, didn't always uh, do so for the right reasons. And so I just mm. became fascinated by humanity and who steps up to be a leader. And back then in my childhood, it was a tall male who would be able to step as, up as a leader inside that culture. Right. And, um, and they didn't get a lot of really good support. So as a result, they became vulnerable to their own inherent weaknesses. Did you take any lessons for how a culture should be or should not be from those early a days? A lot of lessons. I learned so much. Um, I think that the biggest lesson is my mantra that we have as, a, as one of our core values at Recognition. We believe that no leader should lead alone, that Tell they need a peer group, they need they need people they can share with. They need to be continually learning and developing, and they need support. They need a support network. It's very easy Dude. for a leader to get to a point in their career where they know themselves well. They can be self-aware. They can develop the skills and be a passionate and vital leader inside an organization. But unless they've got a safe space to unpackage things and grow and develop and learn how to handle tricky situations, they can very easily forget how the world perceives them. And that can be a really difficult place for a leader to get to. So um, that's a very interesting thought because leadership development, which you specialize in, is usually on point. Like you, mm -hmm. you intervene, you walk yeah. in, a few months later, maybe you walk out. But that safe space needs to persist, right? It needs it to be people, yeah. friends, yeah. psychological support, professional support. Mentors, coaches, mentors, feedback mechanisms. 
And not, not all of the, those leaders I was exposed to as a child were bad people and became corrupt. Many, many of them stayed good and quality leaders. But there were a lot that fell by the wayside because they didn't have decent systems of support and they had no way of getting realistic, meaningful feedback. Some of the um, leaders that, were, that had this safe space or this network of support, how, how were they supported? Like what structures or what people Governance did structures, have around them? Boards, mentors, coaches. Mm. And were they intentional about that or was it, was, the, was it the environment they found themselves in? They were intentional about it. Most of those church structures, going back to what I observed as a child, had something that was there. Um, but if they didn't take that and, and, the, and the feedback wasn't meaningful, because obviously it was of variable quality when it, we're talking about a religious feedback mechanism, um, and it could be that those governance structures weren't effective, and you, you see similar things inside businesses. There's a lot of parallels. So today's leaders... <clears throat> that you work with. Um, what are some of the examples you have seen where, uh, let's take an extreme example, someone that was resistant to being told what to do, to be shown their blind spots, but then came to um, see a bigger picture mm -hmm. after an intervention. Mm -hmm. Have you seen people change as a result of yeah. leadership development? Yeah. I, I got to witness this in, um, in an organization that I sat on the executive team of when I was the head of people and culture at Leading Edge when we became a Best Workplace finalist. And initially when we started on that program of work, I had a CEO who was someone who had the ability to coach and bring out the best in his leaders. And he was strengths-based for that being even conscious of it, but he could also take on board feedback and he was good at giving feedback. But some of his leaders paid lip service to the Best Workplaces program and they didn't see the value of it, but they knew they were on the journey and they had to be committed to it. And so they did, and they were cynical, understandably cynical. But as we started to grow, and it, it did take five years, it wasn't a quick process, but as we started to shift the culture, listen to our people, run focus groups, get feedback, build mechanisms and where we took on board their feedback and we started to make the changes that we needed to make to build this really engaged culture, those leaders started to come on board and they started to recognise that this was a really good tool for them to get meaningful feedback that was anonymous and it gave them this reflective space to go, well, actually... I've got to fix this about me and I've actually got to go and do something different in this area here and this is valuable. I've now got the safe space in which to reflect and grow and I don't think any of them didn't, didn't actually shift over time. They all started to see what would happen when their teams got really engaged and the energy and the extra effort they would go to to go above and beyond once they were fully engaged and then those leaders were able to enable that engagement was, was game-changing for them. Was it traumatic for them to see how people perceive them and their blind spots that they weren't yeah. aware of? Yeah, it's hard. It's hard getting that feedback. It's very painful. Feedback's hard. Really good feedback is painful. I remember um, the first time I had a leader who could give me good feedback, just that sort of <gasps> feeling that occurs mm. and... Um, and, and I'm, I'm happy to, to share the details of what that, that first solid piece of feedback I got. I've, over the years, I've had leaders who've given me feedback, but this leader, um, he was a CEO, and he, within one week of me being hired, I ran a session with the leadership team off-site around what we needed to do to, to fix the recruitment problem. We had 50% turnover. And I needed to model and work out what they needed to be hiring, work out what was broken, implement a recruitment process, and 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 shift the bar, raise the bar, get it higher. And in that session, I managed to get everything through and all the work done that I wanted to and, and, and the outputs there. And afterwards, he sat me down over lunch and he said to me, how do you think it went? And um, 
I was candid and I said, well, that was tough because I don't know you very well and I don't know the team very well. Mm. We got there in the end and we've got a bit of a blueprint of what we need to do to fix it and it'll be a starting point and probably I'll need to fine-tune it and change it, but we've made a start. And he said, do you want me to tell you how it went? And I wanted <laughs> to know that this was going to be an ongoing process. And I said, yes, please. And so he said, well, you, you did. You did all of those things and you did well. But there was one point there where you – put up some stats and some figures about what had gone on historically. And actually, you might have thrown some of the leaders that you're going to have to work with really closely under the bus when you did that. Oops. And I went, oh, no. And I knew, I knew he was right. And because I could feel the tension in the room and my mind went back and I, oh, yeah. And he said, but don't worry, we're going to fix this. And he, and he sort of, he, he kind of, you can see I was shaking because I was I was wanting to do a good job and I was I was intentional about you know wanting to fix this problem and grow their culture and um, he said come on what we're going to go and do is I'm going to point out who you need to talk to you're just going to go and say hey I'm sorry if you feel like I threw you under the bus I, that was a really rocky error and my apologies and he said just go around to da 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 and he pointed out and he said I'll be here come back and talk to me afterwards I'm in your team we're we're on this journey. And so I went and literally did that, and it shifted the dynamic for me immediately. And then I learned that every time I did something, this would happen. But then every time he did something, he would come and say to me, how did it go? What could I do better? And so together, we went on this journey. And he allowed me to give him feedback, which was awesome and I became more and more and more open to really, really good, courageous conversations. Radical candor, like him, Scott calls it. It, it. You know, when it's really radical, it lands hard, but it allows you to embrace it and learn. It's heartwarming. Uh, and it must have been shocking. Mm -hmm. But the combination is so powerful. Absolutely. The shock with the hand holding. Yeah. So it's all right. We all make, all make mistakes. Yep. Um, what what are the what are the elements of good feedback in your mind? Oh, I, I think it's simple. It is simple because it the key elements it needs to be really quick. Like if we left it till the next day, it would have bested for the others. It needs to be candid, so on point, you know, not ruinous empathy, but really real. So it's, it's got to cut right into the heart of the matter, which is normally that double-edged sword thing. And I think you can gauge it by the ears of the receiver. Now, bear in mind, I, I hadn't worked with him very long, so I hadn't built a, a close relationship with him. But, boy, we got close really fast because mm -hmm. I knew he was in my team and that he was going to help me solution the fix, and then every time I got feedback, I knew that would happen. So quick, fast, on point. Did it, does it need to be personal? Yes. Because I, I feel if you talk about a situation or a task as opposed to talk about the person, um, that's one. And secondly, if you talk about your feelings, like my feelings as an observer giving the feedback, mm. I think... When I do that, this puts me in a, in a position of vulnerability because talking about feelings is vulnerable. Yeah. And by talking about a person specifically rather than a situation or a task requires courage. Mm. So I'm doubly exposed when I give that feedback, if it's personal yeah. and if I share my feelings. Yeah. So maybe it's also um, another ingredient of, of candid feedback. Mm. Um, I often uh, see articles where they talk about trust as checking the boxes. So taking care of people and um, having open communication channels and talking about, um, you know, putting the programs in place. But in my experience, it's never about that. It's about... Uh, like Patrick Lencioni says, it's about admitting weakne weaknesses, admitting mistakes, mm. 
uh, being candid about yeah. how you feel and what's wrong. And it's really hard to do. You know, I, I really love Brene Brown on this subject. She does a lovely little video, you know, the difference between empathy and trust. And sorry, empathy and sympathy. It's really easy for us to find a place of sympathy for someone. But you have to dig deep to your own personal experience to find empathy. And when you use true empathy and you, you can put yourself in their shoe and you can be alongside them in their vulnerability, that's when oxytocin, the neurochemical, the moral molecule, as Paul Zach would call it, turns up. And it's airborne. So when we have it there, when we're able to be vulnerable with each other, that's when trust gets built. So I want to dive more into neuroscience, uh, but also I, I want to add to what you said about Brené Brown. I, I, I love her teachings mm. uh, and how she's humane, direct, and very vulnerable about herself and yeah. um, <clears throat> how she communicates. So she says about <clears throat> sympathy versus empathy. Sympathy is like looking at someone who's fallen in a, a well mm. and saying, oh, you poor thing. I hope someone comes over and rescues you. Yeah. And empathy is like, you must be in pain all over your body and you must be scared and you must be yeah. uh, feeling so lonely at, at this moment. It must be dark down there. Mm. Um, and uh, in her definition, I think empathy is feeling what the other person is feeling. Yeah. Uh, which to me really explains how you need to understand uh, human connection. Yeah. And it's, it's feeling what the other person is feeling. It's not sitting in judgment. Or observation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so. On to neuroscience, which is fascinating, um, creating a connection between leadership and neuroscience. So one of the things I didn't know, I, I learned it from you. Uh, you. You said that oxytocin, which is a neurotransmitter, um, is airborne. Yeah. You so, can detect it in our blood as well. But, you know, have you ever been in a room when a baby's just been born? Yeah. It's flooded with oxytocin. Mm. It's it creates human connection. It creates a bond, but it is also what turns up in teams when they trust each other. So Paul Zach he started experimenting ways to detect it um, when he was researching oxytocin or trying to find the moral molecule. And he got invited to a wedding in the south of England. It was a small wedding, and I think they might have been neuroscientists as well. And, and he said, I'll come to your wedding from New York if I can test everyone's blood before and after the ceremony. And the wow. story always sticks with me because, of course, the oxytocin levels spiked afterwards. He was able to detect it in their blood. But you know when you go to a wedding, and I was in one on the weekend, actually, and you know that moment when the bride walks down the aisle, that moment of absolute vulnerability, I myself felt the tears behind my eyes. And I could see the groom welled up. Everybody did. She did. It was a beautiful moment. Oxytocin. So how do you use neuroscience when you work with leaders? Do you use it consciously? I do. I, I use it around four key ingredients. I call it your daily dose. So I think le leaders need to understand this. Because in a way, if they think about everything they're doing in terms of the daily dose, of neurochemicals that we need. And, and these neurochemicals have multiple applications, but if you think about these four neurochemicals and how they integrate with the way we work, you can see that the right balance of them is good for us. So dopamine, for example, that's the D in dose. I'm very cheesy, I like anagrams. So dose, dopamine is a neurochemical that it drives us to do things. It's an achievement neurochemical. They have multiple applications, these neurochemicals, but in relation to work, leaders need to understand that they need to give their team members achievable work. They need to coach and develop them so that they're at the right point in their career to do that achievable work, and they need to not overload them. Um, 
So giving them the right amount of work so that they can actually achieve the outcomes, to get that sense of achievement, drives them with dopamine, pulling them back when they start to work too long and too hard and actually make sure they take right breaks and, and that they're, they're working effectively is also a key understanding because you can drive someone with dopamine to the point where they become addicted to it. And that's when you get the workaholic. So they've got to understand the balance of dopamine. Oxytocin, that's a neurochemical responsible for trust, and I think that leaders set the tone for this. If they themselves are vulnerable and they build a culture of vulnerability where feedback is common and candid and frequent, but done in a way that honours the status of those individuals so that people aren't exposed or made fools of, They're pulled into that inner sanctuary, that place of trust, and the leaders build it consistently. They'll avoid that blame culture. Serotonin, the neurochemical for romantic love. That's how we commonly know it. It also turns up in your brain when you're in focus flow. And in flow, that's a a neurochemical state that Jamie Wheel and Stephen Kotler researched with the Flow Genome Project with Google and Microsoft. You get a dose of serotonin that opens up the pathways in your brain. So remember the last time you were in romantic love, and I think all of us can remember an experience like that. We literally become the best version of ourselves. We can't help it. Our pathways all open up. That's why. So we are firing on all cylinders, and it's quite a delightful experience. It's very addictive. Some people get addicted to falling in love. But when we fall in love with another person that's designed to make us bond, serotonin at work doesn't quite turn out the same, although it can do. People do fall in love at work, and I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you're in focus flow and serotonin is turning up in the team and everyone is in sync and they love what they're doing because they love their roles and they, they know what they need to do. So that's a key ingredient. And both oxytocin and serotonin are social bonding agents and they're designed to actually make us work well in groups. We're designed to be in community and workplaces are communities. Final one is endorphins. Yeah, I was waiting for the fourth. Yeah, so they're the neurocabinoids. They're painkillers. They turn up when we exercise. Uh, If you've got a physical role, they're going to turn up there. But the great news is they also turn up in your brain when you go into flow. Um, When you go into focus flow, you get a dose of dopamine and endorphins. And in that state, in a nanodamide, which kind of acts like a bonding agent, and suddenly you are focused on problem solving. And so actually work is good for your brain. There's some positive neurochemicals. As long as you don't flick over into workaholism, which will ultimately lead to burnout, but you stay looking after yourself and you've got the social neurochemicals as well, which happen in Collaborate Flow, then you are actually building positive mental health. And there's a strong correlationship between highly engaged workforces and positive mental fitness. I've seen it. I've been in it. I've witnessed it. I know the difference it makes in the lives of the individuals that work there, their careers, the business that makes commercial sense, plus it riffles out into the community. Have you... uh seen uh, um, seen the change of teaching neuroscience to your leaders um, have you have you have you seen the change as a, a result of understanding neuroscience or as a result of understanding themselves and being becoming better leaders and then that translating into uh, you know your your observations in neuroscience I, I that, think it's a combination of a whole lot of factors for a leader. I think that's just one tool set. I think that alone is not yeah. enough. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, who are some of the leaders in neuroscience that we need to learn more from, that you, I, we need I, to I read up on? Definitely Stephen Kotler and Jamie Wheel, who've done a lot of work in the flow space. Um, I think um, Mihaly Chitsmahali is another yeah. absolute thought leader in that space. Um, Brené Brown in terms of that culture of trust and vulnerability. Kim Scott mm-hmm. on radical candor. Mm-hmm. Because what they do is practical and you walk away from reading their work or 
They share so much online for free that you can literally build it into your practice. You can absorb it online and then you can apply it straight away. And that's what makes a difference. I think Matthew Townsend and his neuroscience work around sleep is also fundamental. Because as you work your way up the leadership chain, you will be under more and more pressure and you, you need to become resilient yourself in order to create resilient cultures. The other thought leader I really like is um, Salem Ismail. Um, he wrote Anti-Fragile, which is a really interesting piece of work around resilience and the new science of becoming anti-fragile and and. Nassim Taleb, sorry, not Salem Ismail. Nassim Taleb, Salem, yeah. Salem is the guy who wrote, um, who's, who started up um, a university. Singularity University. Yeah, yeah, which is also a really great source of research and, and free resources. Yeah, but Nassim Taleb's work around both black swan, that accidents um, don't happen accidentally, and actually we can check back and review how things went wrong in order to find out what we can do differently which is a great mm. principle for anti-fragile as well. That ability to bounce forward under pressure and, and to develop not just our IQ, but our EQ and our AQ and our SQ, which leaders have to be able to build. If we move on to leadership development, Sandy, mm. I know you have a very practical framework, but also one which resonates with me. And you talk about leading self and leading others and leading leading the um, business the, the community in the business yeah can you tell us more yeah so i'm very passionate about this i think that um organizations need to articulate really clearly to their leaders how they want them to lead and those three key areas every leadership Every company should have a leadership development framework in place that says really clearly how they want them to lead around leading themselves, leading others, leading the business, and specifically in some key areas in each of those topics. When it comes to leading the business, obviously, the, the key fundamentals of what is the commercial acumen you need to have to be a great leader in this environment, what, it, what is the strategic and business planning processes, the budgeting processes, the P&L, all of those kind of things along with how is performance measured. Those are the ABCs. And when I first started out as a leader, that was what I thought I needed to know. But I discovered that actually it's the soft skills. Even if you look at leading others, there's some really clear transferable skills that you can go and get training on around recruitment, development, um, inductions, orientations, career pathways, career development for your team. And then communication systems and processes, how to run effective meetings, all the way through to communicating in town halls and being able to present on the organization externally. And then courageous conversations. That's a key soft skill for, from dealing with difficult people to coaching and developing others and then actually being able to have those tough conversations and good, robust feedback all the way through to maybe having to set someone free if, they don't, if they're not working out ultimately mm -hmm. the end. But you've probably got a people and culture team that will support you through that process, and that's, a, that's the last case resort. But the key area is actually leading yourself. That's where it should start. I, I just did a leadership development framework for Whoop, the food box company here in New Zealand, and they, they literally put that as the top, being able to lead yourself, lead others, and then lead for business, which I thought was a really nice way to put it. Um, and leading yourself, what does that mean? It means actually understanding how to be resilient. What are you doing to look after yourself so that you're showing up and bringing the energy into the room, that you are able to be there for your team, that you actually have good mechanisms in place to take breaks, to um to look after your own mental fitness and that you're on a journey of doing that, that you sleep well, that you eat well, that you um, focus well, that you're actually able to take time off and go and do things for yourself. Um, and then your values, what are your values and how do they line with the organization? And what if you had a value conflict? How do you deal with that? Where's a safe space for you to process that and actually resolve that? And then also how... Are you going to be, as a leader, what kind of legacy do you want to lead? 
leave? And how, how does that organization need you to leave? What is the leadership culture there? Is it servant leader? Um, you know, all the way through to Patrick Lencioni's building cultures of trust and building the blocks mm-hmm. around understanding the neurochemistry of leadership, but also the practical skills around showing up every day as a leader and leading a legacy in the lives of your teams. Because we all remember those amazing leaders that could give us good feedback, that were there for us, that could connect with us, that knew how to practice real deep empathy, and um, they didn't rescue us. They helped us step up and grow our careers. How do you help someone discover <clears throat> their own leadership style, their own comfort zone when it comes to leading? Because was, there's too many things you can do. examples out there. Yeah. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, a variety of components. There are a lot of different tools you can use all the way from your working genius, from Patrick Lencioni to DISC or um, HDMI. Strengths Finder. There's, yeah, there's lots of those different tools. And I think they all have a little bit of value that they can add and they can give you different lenses to look through so that you can understand the way that you're going to work with your team, but also understand yourself and, and see objectively how you're coming across. I think 360 tools are really valuable too because at the right point in someone's career, they need to be getting that feedback from not just their manager, their self-assessment and their team's assessment and their peers' assessment to create a space where they can look and see the areas that they need to grow in and develop in and, and get feedback from other perspectives. And then there's also a really good culture tool that can measure what's going on in their team. Like I talked about mm-hmm. that Best Workplaces program that was an employee engagement mm-hmm. survey, and I think they need to be mm-hmm. measuring that and seeing that and getting that anonymous feedback as well. Because sometimes there's things that people just aren't brave enough to tell them. Um, I personally found more about my own leadership style in uh, Entrepreneurs Organization, EO, which I know you've worked with a few people yeah. who are members of EO. <clears throat> and to me, it was purely because I, as a CEO, I ended up reporting in someone else's board to another, um, to the team leader. And as a CEO, I never had the opportunity, or as long as I was CEO, I never had the opportunity to report someone else. And I did that a few times. And every time, every committee I was serving in, I was observing the leadership style. And I was picking up one or two things from each leader. Mm. Um, Like from one leader, I can remember, I picked up a question, which is, how does that sound to you? How does that sink in with you? How does that resonate with you? Yeah. Uh, he was throwing an idea and he was just, he was not asking for my thoughts. He was asking for how this was resonating. Yeah. And I felt, you know, this, this triggered empathy um, in, in so many ways. And I, I basically uh, ripped and ripped off and duplicated it. I R and D it. Um, um, and, Similarly with other leaders, I was looking at one or two things from their leadership style and coping it. Mm. But that's the only way I found I could develop my own leadership style because I was fed with Western literature about leadership with um, role models being Steve Jobs and, you know, Bill Gates and all that, being in the tech industry myself. Yeah. yeah. And these were for me the wrong role models yeah. in many ways. And I remember um, when I was teaching, so my role was a leader of students, I thought that, you know, this omnipotent role of a leader was one that knew everything. Yeah. Same, that's how And I- so I felt I had to know everything. Yeah. So when I made mistakes, I couldn't own up to them. Yeah. And that made me look silly. Yeah. 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 And so it took me a long time to do away with this uh, initial um, set of role models, which I read up on from, again, Western male leaders. Uh, into ones that were much more closer to what I feel 
my own leadership style is. So it, it's it's a lot of work. Mm. It's a good, great leader, isn't it? The leader who can be humble, who can actually grow the careers of those around them, but takes the time to access that deep empathy and can be vulnerable with their own team. And that builds a culture of vulnerability and real and authenticity. And when you have that, you get the human factor turning up. Um, And we have very few to even zero role models like that in the press, Mm. uh, in the public sphere. Yeah. uh, Because for some reason, these are not, uh, uh, this cannot be associated with a successful go-getter uh, who, you know, um, builds amazing technology or who um, scales their business or who makes a uh, you know, quick exit or whatever. Uh, we don't have role models of servant leaders, of humble leaders, of leaders who take you by the hand when you've made a mistake. You know, we, th- these are not the, the leaders out there. And this, this was, to be honest, my motivation for starting the podcast because mm. I wanted to surface those leaders um, and have more people become aware of what uh, I think real leadership is about, which is becoming a leader or, or helping others become leaders. Yeah. In your in your uh, in your in your absence. Yeah. Yeah. So um, enough about me. Uh, I want. I would like to hear more about uh, culture. Sandy, and what makes you passionate about culture, company culture? Well, I know that when you get a positive company culture, and bear in mind only the top 20%, and they're now saying the top 17% are positive, you know, would really get up there in terms of being able to win awards for having a fully engaged and enabled culture. But I see the, the products of that when I go and work in organizations that do that well. And I, and I had the chance to do that at Leading Edge or to be part of that journey and to observe it from the, 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 um, the engine room. And then I also got to see it at IBM when I was working across multiple cultures. And then I get to see that inside my clients that achieve that difficult benchmark. And it is a journey. You, you, you know, there's no silver bullet to get there. You have to measure, remeasure using a culture tool mm. and then you have to actually take on board the tough learnings and then you've got to do a program of work that's related to those tough learnings. So it's not um, easy. But what I see in those organisations is the leaders growing their careers and I see that um, the people are growing their careers and I see the spin-off of the, the, the side effects of that and the positive mental health. And I think the two are inextricably linked and the, and the longer I work in this field, the more I think that given that mental distress now is running at an all-time high and the data tells us through the Resilience Institute that definitely one in three, if not one in two, are going to experience mental distress in the course of their lives. If they're working for an organisation that has is, is got a fully engaged culture in that top 17%, they are going to have the resources and the support that they need to actually resolve that quickly or to function as well as they possibly can in that environment. Because in there is a community of support. And what do you, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say the the key to that is actually leaders knowing how to balance performance with care, which is a fine line. Um, Good leaders care about their people, but they also need to get them to perform and the skills to be able to do that and to be able to understand how to deal with complex situations have to be taught. It's not obvious. How do you instill a sense of ownership? So, of course, you have to take care of your people, but yeah. you have to ask your people to take care of the business. How do you do the latter? Well, I think if you're looking after your people and they're proud of the organization and you've got the key ingredients right and the culture is positive and strong, they'll have that sense of ownership because they'll feel proud to be part of it. I don't think you can and superimpose it. I think it comes from mm-hmm. within. It's intrinsic, like motivation. There are. Um, there's that side, which is people have or 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 
people feeling the need to reciprocate because you've taken good care of them and you've given them autonomy and you've yes. given them the space to be themselves and to do great work. Mm. And there's also a part which has to do with giving them the tools to act like owners. And um, one of the my of, one of my favorite books there is the Great Game of Business. Yeah, yeah. Which um, basically says make people aware of finances. What does it mean to turn a profit for one dollar of um, revenue? How much profit is a business generating? Yeah. And then the second one is well, now how does this apply to our business? Mm. And the third one is. Can you make people responsible for leading indicators, um, sales leads, uh, stock time, um, you know, um, a warehouse uh, um, issues or whatever else that lead uh, to a profit? So how can you make them responsible for these metrics, which then translate into profitability? Yeah, and it's a really good way to let people know how their role connects to the um, the vision or the strategy of the business and how it actually generates revenue mm. and how mm. it minimizes cost. And then when, they're, when mm. they actually understand, people feel like they're included, they're involved, they're being developed, and then mm. they're, they're able to grow within that. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Um, Sandy, as we wrap... Um, I meant to ask you about this le game I love to play with, with guests, and I know you love to play with your clients, which is two truths and one lie, uh, because it's a great way of getting to know you a little better. Yeah. So what are two truths and one lie in no particular order about you? So a fun fact, and I, I often say this um, when I'm running a workshop, is I introduce myself with my nickname. So my, this is a fun fact. My nickname is Mama Trample. Um, don't Google it, though, because there's also a porn star called Mama Trample. <laughs> um, I'm a roller skater. I, I grew up roller skating. Uh, my daughter became a roller skater. And, um, and I also like to deep sea dive. I'm quite a physical person. I like uh, getting out in the environment. So if I would guess the lie would be the third one? How did you do that so fast? <laughs> <laughs> well, the first one, <laughs> the first one you said about the porn star, and I knew there was a story behind it, and you knew about the story, so you could tell it com com comfortably. And the second one you said about your daughter, so it wasn't just yourself, you know. <laughs> yeah. But then the third one, I knew you were into hiking, but then. I thought maybe she's not into deep sea diving, which you must must get amazing opportunities to do that in New Zealand, right? There yeah, must be yeah, coral do. reefs around there. I have I have dived once um, off the Great Barrier Reef, and I hated it. It was terrifying. Um, not only did you have to wear a suit to stop the nasties from getting in and biting you, mm. um, I was surrounded mm. by sharks and Ooh. all sorts of venomous creatures, yeah. and I couldn't wait to get out of the water. Not to mention the fact that they tell you before you go under and do a deep sea dive that um, if you hold your breath too long, you will probably asphyxiate. And so the whole Oops. dive, surrounded by these beautiful colorful fishes i was terrified <laughs> so i don't love don't do this at home <laughs> yeah wonderful so um sandy when when you uh, encounter a leader who is not intentional about their culture mm. what do you like to to whisper to them what do we need to be more um thoughtful what do we need to rethink about culture more mm. so generally speaking if I, I encounter a leader who's not intentional about culture i i would whisper to them that leadership can be lonely and i wonder what your people think of you i wonder what you don't know and quietly most of them are worried about that. 
That's so powerful. And you did almost whisper it uh, as as you would to someone's ear, and I think it yeah you know, it, it 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 goes deep. And what if you um, didn't have to lead a lie? What if it could be different? Amazing. It reminds me actually of when we built the first leadership framework um, at Leading Edge. I had the wonderful opportunity of going back and building it after running the Best Workplaces program. And I got to hire an L&D manager, an industrial psychologist, so I can't claim to building that framework all on my own. But I came across this fundamental internal values conflict in myself where I'd grown up in the Pentecostal church I wasn't in part of that movement anymore. I, I didn't. I didn't believe in that anymore. Um, but I still had this weird internal value in me that came from that world, where, from a religious perspective, humankind is not capable of leading themselves. In fact, if you look around the planet, you can see many examples of how we're not. That we actually need a transcendent higher power. And I thought, well, hang on. If I'm sitting with that, that's not actually helpful. That's not helping me. And how many religions believe that? And I looked across all the religions and many of them fundamentally instill that into their congregations and their followers. And I had to kind of weed it out of myself and go, it's not true. Um, Actually, people are inherently able to choose to have a growth mindset so people can choose to be an effective leader if they choose to. It's not about good or bad. And, um, and, I, and I wondered to myself, well, I'm probably in this unique position where I'm looking at it at a very fundamental level and I had to kind of deal with that internal conflict. And I, and I wonder how that influences people in those tough times when I've seen many amazing leaders crack under pressure. You know, they've either burnt out or they've gone down a pathway they didn't want to. They've had an affair and or they've done something that they actually they'd never intended to do. But they cracked under the pressure. And I wonder if there's a, you know, there's if they had that space where they, they didn't have to lead alone, where they were supported and encouraged and they could Grow and develop their skills. That's one of the things I love about EO, is it creates a safe space. Indeed. Because leadership's tough. And, it's also um, a very, very valuable journey. And it also reminds me that we should lead with love and not fear. Yeah. Um, love of being ourselves and without the fear of judgment, or failure, of yeah. not being good enough. Yeah. And with that, I'd like to thank you, Sandy. Um, we could maybe go on for another episode, but I think it's time we wrap. I'd like to keep these short. Yeah. Uh, and thank you for your, uh, your insights on neuroscience, your um, wisdom of how you train your leaders. Uh, your stories of compassion and of learning, uh, learning the hard way. Mm. Um, And uh, yeah, I hope more leaders lead from a place of compassion Mm. and love, but not fear. Yeah, I agree. Cultures of growth and, and love and compassion create really amazing environments that are commercially sensible as well. And uh, with that, thank you for everyone listening. If you want to keep in touch and not miss any of the next episodes, you know you need to hit that subscribe button. And I always love feedback and learning, so don't forget to tell us what you think by emailing rethink at rethinkculture.co and keep leading with love and not fear. Thank you so much, Andreas. What an honor to be part of this. Thank you.